to the Great Horn Pagans podcast. Here we discuss all matters paganism, heathenism, witchcraft, history, and mythology. Leave a like, leave something nice in the comments, share this with everyone, and enjoy yourselves on this amazing episode of the Greyhorn Pagans podcast. It is good to have you all here, and I am here once again, of course, with a amazing guest, um, Mario from Symbolic Studies. Uh, I mean, many who who know me and the people that I am friends with, the fellow podcasters that I'm friends with, should know Mario and his, his stuff by now. But for the ones who don't, I mean, first of all, Mario, thank you for joining, and uh, yeah, introduce yourself, man. For sure. Yeah. So my project is called Symbolic Studies, as you mentioned, and I have a site, SymbolicStudies.com. If people are curious to find uh, where I'm located elsewhere, they can find my links to Instagram and YouTube and Twitter and things like that there. I started Symbolic Studies four years ago, and it was a way for me to talk about a lot of what I was learning with symbolism. I've been a graphic designer for a good while now. I started when I was like 16 years old playing around in Photoshop and Illustrator and now I'm 40 years old. And just kind of throughout my career with design, I became increasingly more interested in, you know, symbolism and occultism, esoterica, things like that. I've always been very, very visual. visual. And so I went to film school for a number of years and I realized that I really liked decoding things and interpreting things and learning what different symbols represent what different colors represented you know at some point i found the tarot and that really opened me up to a whole new world right um numerology and uh, mythology and just kind of different occult sort of themes and you know just everything that's baked into the tarot and then that really got me into astrology and wanting to know more about the zodiac and so i started researching each sign during the sign itself and then at some point i started creating content for each sign and i figured if i'm going to be a symbologist i should really have a concrete really solid foundation you know with astrology and what each sign represents and then from there i've branched out into other things you know i've been collecting like symbolic resource books for a number of years too so that's kind of my style is if i'm going to be looking into a sign i want to know more about the objects it's associated with. And so I have a lot of resources at my disposal, right? To look into the nature of the scales as an example, right? I can look through 20 or 30 different books that I have in my library uh, wow. to find out more about scale symbolism. So that's kind of my thing is finding little gems in these different resources and kind of bringing them uh, to the people and to people who follow my channel. That is very elaborate and just 20 books on one particular thing. Wow. Uh, you're taking it really seriously and good thing too. You know, you're um, from my understanding from what I've seen, like you're the go-to guy now when it comes to understanding symbols and symbolism and symbology, because it's of course the, um, was it Confucius who said that signs and symbols rule this world, not sure. rules nor laws. Um, and indeed, especially in the, uh, the occult and the esoterica, symbolism is just, it's so incredibly important because that is how how things are communicated. Um, I mean, we do that nowadays even, but like through the medium of memes, 
for example, or like very basically like emojis, which are just symbols in a way, but expressing something and, yeah. you know, you know what, what this particular emoji means or send this emoji to you, then, you know, it pervades some sort of a, a message. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, symbols are really everywhere and it's not just the corporate thing, like how people know you. And there are two symbols in particular that, um, I have always been very curious about, or one that I see popping up more and more nowadays, someone that I've always been curious about. Those are, uh, the X because you see that in just in so many, um, like so many different ways, like, and not, not just, you know, the, the media platform, but also, uh, you know, X marks the spots. For example, you have the, the skull and crossbones, which are a X, you know, if something is very spicy, let's say you call it X rated triple X when it's, you know, extra, extra X rated. So yeah. Why? Why X? Like just because it's so simple to draw, or like, <laughs> what's? It's a great you know, question, man. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I don't know if this was your intention, but there's actually a lot of crossover between Janus and and the X, right? The two things that oh, we're is. here to talk about. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, a lot and, of crossover. Um, crossover. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, you know. So my. What I'm realizing about my style of decoding and where it comes from is that I fall into more and more, the more I read, the older I get, I'm falling into a philosophical camp that some people have referred to as perennialism or traditionalism. And sort of the main core there, there's several tenets there, but what I take away from it is that there was an underlying tradition to all traditions. And the further back you go, there was a universal tradition. So there's a route to modern traditions. And in a way, all modern traditions and symbology go back to this original tradition. Sometimes this original tradition is referred to as the primordial tradition. If people mm -hmm. want to look into it, I sometimes refer to this as the polar tradition or the polar Northern tradition. And so the way I tend to decode is that I'm filtering it through this early tradition and how the symbols from this early tradition evolved sort of over time. And so people will realize if they follow my work enough that a lot of the things I decode in symbolism go back to this root, right? It's mm -hmm. no different than like a world tree sort of thing. There's many branches on the world tree, but there's one trunk, right? There's yeah. one seed that everything came from. It's really no different than that. And so what I've learned is that a lot of modern people, they filter things through a modern lens, a modern Western lens, right? If you live in this part of the world. And I see that there is sort of a skewing with decoding that a lot of people do, unless they've actually taken the time to learn about this early tradition and the symbols generally associated with it. And the authors that really write about it too are some of the greatest symbologists to me in, in the modern world. So I have to shout out uh, a fellow named Rene Ganon and he is wow. amazing. He's fantastic. What I realized is that some of my favorite books on symbolism are my favorite because he heavily influenced them. He in heavily influenced the authors and he's referenced multiple, multiple times. And what he did was he brought a lot of information from the Eastern world and brought it to the West. And yeah. he really kind of was like a bridge, you know, in so many different ways. And so I really value and appreciate what he's brought to the table. And once I came across his work and how he decoded things that really made way more sense than a lot of the other more modern authors that I was reading. So as an example, the X, why the X, where did the X come from? What does it really mean? I mean, there's multiple ways to kind of break it down, but I would say, you know, first and foremost, let's just look at the way it looks, right? Let's just look at the actual shape of it, right? You have mm -hmm. two cross lines. The X to me is very much related to the cross itself, right? Or the plus sign. And sure. so you have four quarters 
you have four arms. They all extend from a central point. Essentially, the X is two lines, right, that cross each other. Essentially, the cross is two lines that cross each other. And what I've realized with both symbols is that there is a lot of four symbolism associated with the cross, associated with the X. And what I've realized, too, is that a lot of old emperors and lords and kings also relate to the four. So Christ, as an example, right? The king of kings, he was yeah. crucified on a cross. Jupiter, the king of the planets, his glyph actually looks like the number four. And so yeah. there's a very good reason why this cross was associated with kings and emperors and lords. The reason being is that my understanding of things is that these leaders of these different empires and, and whatnot, they wanted to rule from a central location. And so sometimes uh, this central location can fall into uh, the science of uh, centrography of people in the ancient world wanting to know where the center of their land was. So if you lived on an island, it was kind of important to know the center of the island, right? And oftentimes this center location was marked with a totem. Sometimes there would be a standing stone there. There would be a, a, perhaps a family tree or their version of a world tree. Mm -hmm. There could be a temple. There could be a mound. Um, there could be all sorts of different things there, right? But from this central location, the four cardinal directions emanate, north, south, east, and west. So another way of saying that would be a cross emanated or an X emanated from this central location. As you already mentioned, X marks the spot, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's really where these two lines intersect. That is the sort of sacred center for their land, basically. And so the idea of a king wanting to rule from the center means that they connect all of the quadrants of their space or of their empire or land together. And so from there, from that center location, they would have the northern end of uh, their empire, the southern end, western end, eastern end, and they basically bound all of the quarters together. So this great cross was a quartering of the land. And these emperors and kings, they also believed that by being in the middle, that they connected heaven and earth together, which is what a lot of these temples and totems in this central location, what it kind of represented. It kind of represented the place where we can congregate and commune with the gods, if you will. Almost like coming around a world tree and uh, the tree in and of itself being a symbolic bridge between the above and the below, right? And so the standing stone represents the same thing. Basically, the stone represents the same thing. One of the sort of modern, I guess, kind of correlations with this would be the Kaaba Cube in Mecca. And so people from all over the world uh, have this reverence for this central location. To them, that is the center of the world, symbolically. They pray to that central location, you know, five times a day. And then it's their duty to actually take a pilgrimage and go to this location. And so this becomes their spiritual pole. That cube, that cube becomes their spiritual pole. And it's actually interesting in the tarot deck, the fourth card of the major arcana is the emperor card. And this card is sometimes referred to as the cubic stone. And he actually is sitting on a cubic stone. And so what is the cube all about? The cube has six sides. There's a forward, backward, there's a left and a right on the cube. There's also an up and a down. So the cube in its own way represents six directions uh, of the six directions of space. So from where anyone is at who might be listening, there is a forward, backward, a left and a right, and an up and a down. So old kings and emperors used to be referred to as unifiers, that they not only unified the quarters of their land, but they also unified heaven and earth. And this old practice was sometimes referred to as the great triad that there is a triune relationship between heaven, earth, and man, and that we symbolically are like a bridge or we are a uh, connection between heaven and earth, right? There's so much to go on about all of that stuff, but the cross plays its own role because it represents a sacred center 
which all sacred center locations, whether you're talking about Mecca as an example, or you're talking about Jerusalem, there's a lot of symbolism associating Jerusalem and the Temple Mount with being the center of the earth. Wherever people take a pilgrimage to and they consider to be their holy land, this is all just a blueprint for the original holy land, in my estimation, or the original paradise, which would be in the north, you know, in the northern portion of Earth, which would be the central portion of Earth, which is where people say four rivers emanate or the four winds come out of, right? And so when we're dealing with the four, once again, we're dealing with the cross, the, these four rivers coming from a central location, making a cross, these four winds potentially coming from a central location. Sometimes the four winds are kind of depicted as coming from the four corners of earth though, too, mm -hmm. kind of making a cross, right? If they're all blowing, you know, towards the center. Yeah. So when you're dealing with the cross or you're dealing with the X, that central point where the lines cross over is symbolically the fifth point. So every square, every cross, every X actually has a symbolic relationship with the number five. And so the number five then relates to the fifth element, which would be spirit or which would be ether. The number five relates to the pentacle or the pentagram, right? All five elements. So there's a lot of different things that I've seen throughout my research that basically indicates that the emperor wants to be the fifth point that unifies all four other elements, all the four elements, right? And that they are actually in control. So like in ancient China, I know, and other places too, I've seen different like motifs, statues and paintings and things like that, where the emperor is being pulled by four horses. These four horses are symbolic of the four elements. He himself is the fifth element, right? And so even in the tarot, uh, the chariot card, oftentimes the charioteer, he's in his little container that is the chariot, that is the vehicle. He's surrounded by four posts or four pillars. He is the fifth post. He is the central pillar, basically. That's another way of putting it, is that they are the center. They are the way. They are the middle path. They are the middle pillar. And actually, a lot of leaders correspond with the idea of being a pole because this central totem is the point of pivot for these people. And I've shouted this book out so many times, but there's this great book called At the Center of the World by John Michel. And he really gets into it here. It's called Polar Symbolism Discovered in Celtic, Norse, and Other Ritualized Landscapes. And so if people want to oh. know more about this science, about this quartering of the land, about these, uh, you know, these different sort of central locations that have these four roads that emanate from it, and this central location having some sort of central totem. And this totem is what stabilized the people because it was their frame of reference because the center relates to orientation. It gives you perception on where you're actually at. So these people in the ancient world, oftentimes they had a central location that they believed connected heaven and earth together. This was the point of orientation. It's no different than like the North Star, which also yeah. gives you orientation, right? Polaris. And once this central location or central totem or object was lost or destroyed, this brought a lot of confusion to the people because they no longer had a way to orient themselves, right? And so a lot of people today are people without a pole people without a spiritual pole, but you yeah. still see examples out there like the Kaaba cube. That's their spiritual pole. That's why they look to it no matter where they're at in the world. That's why they travel there. And then they go around the Kaaba cube counterclockwise seven times, which is very, very interesting. Counterclockwise is a rotation that brings you closer inward to that center, brings you closer to within actually. The fixed stars go counterclockwise around the pole star. The clockwise rotation actually is more expansive. It's more solar. So clockwise is yeah. more solar and expansive. Counterclockwise is actually more polar and, and more receptive. Oh, wow. So, uh, yeah. So those are just a few things that the X makes me think about. It's, it's basically essentially related to the cross. And when yeah. you're dealing with the cross, you're dealing with four cardinal directions. And you're dealing mainly with that center point, which is the point of ascension, which is why the crossing over thing, like as you already mentioned, makes so much sense. You go to a graveyard and you're going to see a lot of crosses yeah. because it represents crossing, literally crossing over to the other side, right? 
And in my world, personally, when people refer to crossing over to the other side, from what I've researched, and this is part of the primordial tradition, a lot of ancient peoples believed that the stairway to heaven is in the north, that it literally is in the northern sky, that the constellations that are right around Polaris, the pole star, was the doorway to the great beyond, essentially, you know, to the spirit realm or to the underworld, whatever you want to say. There's a bunch of different ways of interpreting sure. it, but it's uh, if there's a stairway or a ladder or uh, oh. some sort of bridge to that place that it exists in the northern sky. And that's partly even what this artwork, in my opinion, you know, symbolically represents, right? So that central yeah. mountain, that central tree, the trunk of that central tree, right? My personal opinion is that all realms above and below, or there are actual realms above and below, and they are all connected through their center, essentially. And so X marks the spot. They're all connected through their center, and in a way, these different realms above and below are not unlike wheels. And so all of these wheels above and below are connected through their axle. And so our chakras, as an example, the, our chakra system, chakra means wheel, right? Yeah. And they're all connected symbolically. You know, you could say that our spine is like the axle for these wheels. And the way you can access these other realms above and below is by going to your center. The center of self and the center of the cosmos are actually linked together. You don't break out. Some people want to like break out of the matrix, right? You don't break yes. out. You actually break in. That That's how it's done. It, it's an inward sort of process. It's an inward yeah. sort of journey, right? Mm -hmm. And so the wheel itself too, you know, you have the spokes emanating from the center, right? It kind of, if you break down the wheel into its like most basic parts, at the very least in my mind, it's almost like you need four spokes. You need that cross or you need an X, yeah. right? To create that wheel. And the center part of the wheel is the most balanced part of the wheel. The external part of the wheel relates to things outside of self. It relates to division or multiplicity. When you get to the center part of your wheel, um, this is where the reconciliation of opposites occurs. This mm -hmm. is the still point within. And when you get to the center of the wheel, this is when you're truly present, basically. And you become what's referred to as the unmoved mover. There's all these ideas that the Lord or emperor or the king or God even is stationary, but yet makes everything move. They're stationary because they're in the middle, just like the emperor or just like the Lord. Oh. They want to be stationary and immutable, just like that central totem. And by being that central figure, the unmoved mover, they become he who makes the wheel turn, essentially, is what the whole entire dynamic is. And so uh, that's where you want to be in life, in my opinion, right, is, is you want to be centered, you want to be grounded. Right. And uh, when you're there, that's how you access these other realms above and below. So that's kind of my personal opinion. But I think that the X and the cross relate very much together. But it's all about that central point where the two lines cross over each other. Yeah. Wow. OK. That is a lot of information right away. <laughs> yeah. But it's no, but it, it makes it makes sense like I'm, I'm like right away like making some connections because you were talking about the um four rivers and the central points makes me think and especially up here in in the north you know i'm from the netherlands of course so it's a little closer to home for me but i believe that is partially how the lens of hyperborea usually are drawn like a center point at the the north pole like the true north pole a big black rock in the middle and then from there emanating are the four rivers That's um right. <clears throat> and with the the cross if you it, i mean let's let's say you have uh, like two strings you cross them over each other and you pull them both up at the center you get a uh, a triangle a pyramid shape which is another shape you will see very often used very often of course yeah exactly oh, no you're bringing wow. up a couple of great points that i love to expand on just briefly essentially the primordial tradition is hyperborean and that that's how i view it at least 
yeah. and that essentially we're all hyperborean are all of our stories in my opinion no matter where you're at in the world we all have a uh, central location from which um we can call sort of uh the holy land or the original paradise basically right and to yeah. me this makes sense because when you start studying symbolism one of the things that was kind of surprising for me for a number of years and then i really started to get it is how many symbols relate to the center and so the center of what well the center of earth and the center of all things you'll realize that there's a huge correspondence between these ideas essentially right and so this trunk of a world tree if we're going to refer to maybe yggdrasil or something like that this trunk of the world tree the trunk again it binds all of the realms above and below right together that it's the yeah. same center it's not unlike a torus field if you're familiar with that i am um, yes so the Taurus field, everything emanates from the center and then everything returns back to the center. And so in my opinion, the world of symbolism is very much the same way. You're actually just looking to see the relationship of any given symbol, any given myth, any given deity. And you're trying to decode now in my estimation with how I view things, how it relates to the center right is it on its way back how far is it away from it how close is it away from it it's all about the proximity to the center in this way what i kind of see uh, am i still here by chance am i breaking yeah, you up are. a little bit okay no you're good you're good okay right on um the way i tend to see it is imagine like an antenna or or a tower right that emits a signal the signal mm -hmm. that's emitted or even someone who's talking right if you're talking um, the further away you are from the source, then uh, the signal gets lost. The signal becomes distorted. Uh, the signal, there's going to be more noise, right? The noise ratio is going to get higher and higher. And then eventually yeah. that signal is going to dissipate, right? Um, that's kind of what symbolism is, in my opinion. It's like, how close is it to source? How close is it to the origin of all things? And so um, there's a whole metaphysical aspect to all of this, right? that uh, the center of all things actually is where everything literally came from and where everything literally returns to and yet it's everywhere as well at the same time right and yet also this place the center of all things is non-physical it, it goes beyond the physical tangible realm it goes to the symbolic realm basically and so symbolism is always just a reference to something else, right? And now we live in the modern world. So a lot of symbols and words and, and things like that are like references to previous references to previous references, right? <laughs> and so we're so far removed from that center uh, or we're so far removed from the origin of that thing of what it originally meant that it can be kind of confusing of like, what do all of these different things mean? But in my opinion, the school of thought that makes the most sense is that everything has an original sort of uh, location, symbolic location, if you want to refer to it that way, non-physical mm -hmm. location, from which it came from and from which it will also ultimately return to. And so and when I see any symbol, that's how I tend to kind of decode things of like, what does it mean in relationship to this, right? And yeah. I think that this early tradition that they had more of a sort of clear understanding of this dynamic and now that we live in today's age, which I think is very much heavily skewed towards solar symbolism, there's a lot of symbols that uh, I don't agree with that a lot of books, modern books, will say this is a solar symbol and that's it. Like the, the swastika as an example. To me, it's a polar symbol. You know, it's not a solar symbol. If you look in a lot of newer books, you're going to see that it represents like a sun wheel or something along these lines. Yeah. It is wheel-based, but in my opinion, it's actually... It's Ursa Major, the Big Dipper, going yeah. around the pole star, right, throughout the year, essentially. So it's a polar symbol, basically, right? So there's a huge, huge switch, if people have never heard me talk about it, that we live in a, in my opinion, symbolically, we live in a solar paradigm, a solar age, if you will. But the earliest age is actually polar. So there's a great switch from polar symbolism to solar symbolism, essentially. So I look for the solar, or excuse me, I look for the polar angle you know, uh, when I'm decoding things. And it, it makes way more sense and it's way more holistic, right? The other way tends to be, I, I think you're kind of thrown off a little bit and you kind of never really get anywhere. But if you understand the polar tradition or primordial tradition, things tend to kind of fall in place more. And, and the same is true with Janus. Janus is the exact same thing. 
if you look at it from a polar lens, it, Janus as a symbol or deity really, really comes together. If you don't have an understanding of that, I think you're just going to have more and more questions with really what it's all about. Uh, yeah. Now, th with the, um, the Svastika and the Big Dipper, I have definitely seen that uh, before. And polar symbolism, even the uh, what you mentioned before, like the... Um, like the four corners of the kingdom and then like mm -hmm. brought together in, in my mind, I saw the, um, <clears throat> I believe that is called the, the solar cross, uh, which is the, the, well, the cross, the plus with the, uh, just like basically with a ring around it, which is a very common phenomena. If you like go further up north, so let's say like at or around the pole circle, you will see that you will see that very often which the celtic traditions have started using as well as more as the uh, the celtic cross you know the christian cross but with the the circle around its arms and its base but jan as as, as i understand it was a roman god which is southern europe which is not you know not really that close to the, the poles it's you know a whole different climate even you know that they, they actually have some nice sunny weather over there instead of here in the, in you know the northern europe where it's always always cold wet and windy so how does janus relate to uh to polar symbolism yeah 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 i'll explain it and uh a lot of cultures too by the way who have the most overt polar symbolism aren't near the north at all right and so like i'm thinking of like india you go to india there's so much polar symbolism in india it's crazy um but you know they're they're, they're not a northern people so no, definitely not <laughs> right so the thing that needs to be understood with janice in in my opinion uh to understand its polar sort of dynamic is you know i see janice as being very mercurial right mercury is uh is a deity and is a planet that I have a great sort of reverence for personally. There's a lot of polar symbolism baked into Mercury as an example. And so Mercury is a psychopomp. Mercury goes between worlds. So as I was saying, um, to me, there's a lot of symbolism that overlaps with Janus and Mercury. And Mercury was known for being uh, a divine androgyne. That's one of the things, both feminine and masculine. Even as a planet, Mercury is both a feminine uh, planet and a masculine planet. There's two planets under the traditional system that rule two different signs, which is unusual and not common. Venus is one of them. Venus rules Taurus and Libra. Taurus is an earth sign. Libra is an air sign. And then Mercury, which all you have to do is add horns to the glyph of Venus. And now you have Mercury. Mercury, <laughs> it relates to Gemini, which is an air sign, but then also Virgo, which is an earth sign, right? Mercury as an element is both a liquid and a metal. Right. So there's all of this dualistic symbolism associated with Mercury. One of his main objects or, or symbols is the caduceus, which it's the twin serpents going up like a, a wand, essentially. Right. And so this relates to like Kundalini energy and all sorts of things. It really relates to just ascension energy going upward, basically. Right. And so when I see Janus, I see so much mercurial symbolism and Mercury has been associated with Janus as well. That to me, it's, it's too hard to ignore. And so Mercury is a psychopomp. So Mercury Hermes goes between realms, right? He's the messenger of the gods. Mercury is always seen traveling. Mercury is always moving. If he's standing still, oftentimes Mercury's on one foot, implying that he's about to leave or about to take off. It's not uncommon for Mercury to be associated with pillars as well which pillar and pole symbolism are very much related to each other. Mm -hmm. But Mercury being a traveler, Mercury being a psychopomp, he goes between realms, how? Through this central axis that I've been referring to, this central tree trunk, right? The axle that connects all of these wheels of heaven, right, together. That's yeah. how he goes from different planes of existence. That is what the caduceus, in my opinion, is really all about. It's energy going up this central axis. This axis is referred to as the world axis, or it's referred to as the axis mundi. Yeah. This is the idea is that there's a central axle in the center of all things 
that everything revolves around, right? And so this gets back to some of the conversation that we were just having with the cross and the X and everything else, because that is all modeled after this original sort of axis, right? And so this central axis or this central axle has a relationship with the pole star because all of the fixed stars go around this central star. So the pole star, right? Pole, just like an axle. Yeah. And it's really no different. They're very much related. And Mercury relates to the phallus as well. And the phallus is a symbolic pole. I used to say all the time that a lot of sure. symbolism goes back to poles and holes. Another way of saying that is keys and locks. That's another symbolic sort of overlap between the two. And Janice is always seen holding uh, a key, right? Yeah. And Mercury goes up and down between realms through this central gateway, this central axis, whose opening has been basically oftentimes put at the northern sky, that that's the opening out of here. It's almost like the exit out of a cave. That's one of the symbols that's been associated with it, right? That is the gate of gates. That is the door of doors. That is the preeminent opening. That is the preeminent gateway, right? So all door symbolism basically symbolically is modeled after that original door, right? And so Janus relates to doorways and openings yeah. and gateways and all of these things, right? And so... In my opinion, this gateway or this bridge symbolically, because it's related to a pole as well, it's not unlike our spine, that this central axis in the middle of all things, we also have that modeled in the human body and it would be our spine, right? And so yeah. when you see Janus statues and it's two heads looking in opposite directions, they share a common spine, right? There's one spine between the two of them. And so the two heads are looking in opposite directions. It's been said that Janus represents one face represents the future. Another face represents the past. And so in that way, Janus is actually a symbol of, I would say, the present moment as well, because it's this two in one sort of nature, this two in one oh. sort of dynamic. Janus really represents is the middle path, the middle pillar, the middle way in the Kabbalistic tree of life. You're going to have three pillars. You have one mm -hmm. pillar on the left, one pillar on the right. There's a central pillar. This central pillar is the true pillar of transcendence because it's the middle pillar. It's the middle path. It's the world axis. It's the same axis that I'm referring to. So this central axis, sometimes in Kabbalistic symbolism and Freemasonic symbolism, this central pole or, or column sometimes isn't there, but it's always implied. Basically, so if you have two pillars, there is an implied central pillar there. And this central pillar actually predates these other two pillars. The way I tend to look at it, you will see a lot of Freemasonic artwork and Kabbalistic artwork, and you'll see these two uh, pillars or three pillars sometimes. Mm -hmm. One pillar is associated with lunar symbolism. Another pillar is related to polar symbolism. Well, what about that central one? It's polar symbolism. You know, people think that the only dialectic is polar, or excuse me, solar and lunar, but there's actually polar. The, the central pillar is polar in nature because, again, it's truly transcendental. It even goes above and below the other two side pillars. And so Janus is oftentimes holding a spear or a pole. This is a classic symbol that associates with deities that are of the middle path or of this middle way. Oftentimes they're related to travel symbolism too. So um, the fool, the first card in the major arcana, he oftentimes is holding a pole with him. Sometimes he's holding two poles. St. John the Baptist, he's always holding a pole or a staff. The hermit card, which is ruled by Virgo, which is ruled by Mercury, he's always holding a staff with him. This is sometimes referred to, this primordial tradition has sometimes been called the mystic pole tradition. The pole is such a powerful symbol, most modern people have no idea how much it actually relates to and how much it actually means because it's a point of pivot. It's another axle. It's like a hinge. Doors need hinges in order to open, right? The pole star 
it might as well be a hinge star, essentially, right? It's the point of pivot. And I would say a good metaphor for all of this is actually the scales itself. Libra is uh, the middle sign, as an example. That's everything it represents right there. It's a central sign. It's a middle sign. It's the seventh sign out of 12 signs. It brings us from summer to fall. There's equal parts day and night at the very beginning of Libra. And when you think about the scales, the reason why this is on my mind, by the way, is because I just did a huge Libra presentation in person and I really got into this. Awesome. But it's not uncommon for the scales. You see the scales weighing something uh, that's dualistic. You know, I've mm -hmm. seen it where it's like white stones and black stones. I've seen it where, um, you know, it's a, a symbol of the sun and then a symbol of the moon, right? Yeah. But the scales can't function or operate without that central axis right that gives you the point of pivot for the scales to balance each other that yeah. point of pivot is referred to as a fulcrum right so whether you're talking about a teeter-totter or you're talking about the scales or something else it's a point of pivot basically the middle pillar the middle path relates to a fulcrum symbolism it relates to another way of putting this is that this all relates to what's referred to as axial symbolism things that move around a central point of pivot. Libra represents this in the Zodiac as a central sign. Um, and there's so much symbolism that associates with it. The sword is a symbolic object that represents this central axis as well, right? Uh, there's a lot of symbols that are considered axial in nature. The pole right. is one of them. And the key is another classic axial symbol. How does a key work? You got to put it in, you got to turn it, right? So it's almost like an axis into itself. Like I said, poles and holes. Oh, the key wow. would be the symbolic pole. The lock would be the symbolic hole. And this relates to janitor, right? The janitor is the one who carries all of the keys and opens all of the doors, you know, oh. in the school or, or the office or whatever. Yeah, so, and in so, popular uh, media, you see him often walking, mopping the floors. And, you know, the mop, of course, being just a big stick with, a, you know, a thing on it. Wow. Oh, exactly, dude. You got it. Yeah. I, I thought about that too. And I'm like, how interesting is it that the janitor associates with keys and, and mops and the mop is just a long pole because the pole represents so many different things. But, um, you know, it's interesting. We call it a staff, right? It could be a staff as well. The pole, you yeah. know, and then, um, it's a support. So if you're on a journey and you're walking, it supports you on your journey, right? There's an implied forward movement with a walking stick or with a pole. If somebody's holding it, you assume that they're using it like a walking stick. And it's a staff that supports a business, right? The reason why these words are related to each other is because this central pole symbolically represents the central pole or, or, uh, or column in the house of God. The idea is not like a tent. It's not like a tent, how a tent sometimes has that central pole. Mm -hmm. There's this idea that heaven and earth were once fused together. Multiple cultures have talked about this. And it wasn't until a central pole came to be that heaven and earth were separated from each other. So this central pole in the house of God symbolically separates and binds the above and the below, but it's also the bridge between all things above and all things below as well. Wow. Now, now I'm thinking of like so many cultures and, and religions that use like keys and scales. And I mean, um, in, uh, like the ancient right. Egyptian beliefs, of course, the weighing of the soul very exactly. much like very much underworld symbolism. Then again, in Christianity, you have the, the exact opposite with, uh, Peter Petrus, the literally the gatekeeper, where he is the one who grants you access to the kingdom of heaven with, um, you know, holding, literally holding the keys to the kingdom of heaven and also weighing your soul, the good to the bad and Exactly. Oh, oh yeah, you, you yeah, totally got it. So so Peter has a relationship with Petra and essentially it means rock, right? And so God has been compared to a rock, right? Um, to be petrified. And a Pope is the model for the Hierophant card, which is the fifth card in the Major Arcana. The Hierophant is known as the keeper of the keys. He's the keeper of the mysteries. He understands sacred doctrines. It's not uncommon for the Hierophant to have crossed keys, one gold, one silver, 
at the bottom of his feet. That's a common thing. Even the Pope, like the main symbol for the Pope, I can't remember what it's called, but oftentimes he has cross keys, right? One, one silver and one gold as well. It's really, wow. really interesting because the Hierophant card relates to a lot of the symbolism that we're talking about and some of what you just brought up here. The Hierophant card corresponds in Hebrew with Vav, the Hebrew letter Vav, which means nail. And it blew my mind. I'm like, why nail? What does the what does the nail have to do with any of this stuff? And it blew my mind to realize that the pole star is sometimes referred to as the nail star as well. Because it's that central immutable point in the sky that all of the other stars revolve around. And it's also the location of the gate of heaven to cross over to the other side. And the yeah. full title for the Pope is Pontifex Maximus, which means uh, the greatest bridge builder because he is the symbolic bridge, you know, between these different realms, right? He has the understanding yeah. of uh, how to get there and, and, you know, this esoteric information. It also blew my mind, I have to say, because I did a huge presentation on the Hierophant card. St. Peter's Square looks mm -hmm. like a keyhole, right? It looks it like does. a keyhole from an aerial perspective. And, and has right the, in the middle of the keyhole, the obelisk. Yeah, you have the obelisk, right? Poles and holes, right? This obelisk came from Heliopolis, but the the city name before it was Heliopolis. The, that original name escapes me, but it used to mean the city of pillars, essentially, right? And so it meant the city of pillars. Pillar symbolism is world axis symbolism, is world tree symbolism. It's all the same thing, basically, in my opinion. When you have an object that just shoots upward, even if it's a building, you know, the same sort of thing, or a tower, it's the same sort of mm -hmm. thing. It's a bridge between heaven and earth, the Tower of Babel, as an example, right? What were they yeah. trying to do? They were trying to build a tower to storm the gates of heaven, essentially, and then God thwarted their plan. Um, and so the obelisk is very much related to this. So yeah, um, the keys to, to heaven and hell or to the gate of heaven and hell, there's different opinions in, in today's world about where the gate to the other side is, but there's an original gateway that most people agreed upon. And it was in the Northern sky. Once things became lunar and then solar kind of in nature, people started really shifting around where they thought this opening was. But my research brings me back to this original sort of gateway. Um, and so I get so much out of it, of, of thinking about it that way. It's proven itself so many different times that this is like a legitimate sort of way of decoding and everything else. Another thing I would like to say, too, is that January, right? Most people know that January comes from Janus and that there's mm -hmm. an etymological correspondence right with that. January is not too long after the winter solstice. Right. And so yep. the winter solstice and the summer solstice basically is a symbolic pole, pretty much. And uh, there's ancient cultures that had this understanding that we come through the gateway of man, which is cancer. And then we exit through the gateway of Capricorn, which is the gateway of the gods, basically. So cancer and Capricorn are the signs of the solstices, essentially, and that this is a symbolic pole. What I've read from symbolic masters is that if you celebrate your new year um, mm -hmm. around the winter solstice, this is actually indicative of a polar tradition. This is more polar in origin. Capricorn and Saturn has a lot of polar symbolism associated with it, actually. Um, I did a presentation called The Lost Lore of Saturn, and I get into this because the last great golden age which was hyperborean or polar in nature, in my opinion, yeah. was actually ruled by Saturn. That's one of the things that people say often, actually, is that Saturn ruled the last golden age. When people were more polar in origin, Saturn was the main planet, but it doesn't look the way we know it to look today. But consider this, though. Christmas is essentially a solstice, a winter solstice holiday, right? Yeah. Most of the holidays that happen around the solstice are basically solstice holidays, but they're kind of veiled and, and you know, things like that. Where does Santa come from? 
He comes from the North Pole. That's a that's a common understanding. That's a common yeah. thing. Santa is actually probably the most popular northern deity that you can possibly have, right? He comes from the North Pole. He enters through the chimney. The chimney is the symbolic opening in your home. It's not unlike yeah. the opening in the cave that I'm referring to, right? And then he puts trees, excuse me, he puts presents underneath the Christmas tree. It's not uncommon to put a star on top of the Christmas tree. You're putting mm -hmm. the pole star or north star on top of the world tree. That's the symbolism. So uh, the winter solstice heavily corresponds with polar symbolism. This this is a classic thing that I you, you could really get into. There's so much to chew on with that. So yeah, the solstices are is. gates, and, and Janus, it represents the solstices. And what I've heard is that uh, in Christianity, basically, that uh, the transition was from Janus as representing the solstices to the two St. John's representing the solstices. And that's actually what you're going to see in Freemasonry too, the two St. John's. So St. John the Baptist would be the uh, summer solstice, and then uh, St. John the Evangelist would be uh, the winter solstice, if I'm not mistaken. And you'll oftentimes see these two St. John's standing on the sides of a circle, and it's almost kind of like they represent the two pillars, or they represent like the number 11, which I know uh, Janice has a huge correspondence with the number 11 as well. When you see number 11, it's two towers, it, it's two uh, columns or whatever, it's two pillars. There is an implied middle pillar. There's an implied sort of middle way kind of thing. There is, but, uh, but it's, it's the one that you don't see. It's exactly. like literally in exactly. between the ones is the third yes. unseen it, pillar. Yeah. Nope. Nope. You totally, you got it, man. Exactly. So that has been one of the metaphors that I've read regarding the past and present dynamic with Janice is that there is a past and there's a future, one one face looking back and one face looking ahead. But the present portion of it, what, what it really means, it's invisible. The present moment is invisible, symbolically. That's one way of looking at it. It's the ungraspable instant, if you will. But yet we can envision uh, the past and the future, but the present moment kind of has this invisible sort of quality. The middle path oh. always is related to kind of invisibility too, in a way, I would say. Wow, yeah. No, that makes so much right. so much sense actually, because you know the present it's 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 an ever present, so you you don't <laughs> exactly yes. you don't see right. it you don't you don't know it because yeah like we can only see what's like what's happened in the past and we can like envision indeed the the future, but the present is everlasting. Every moment is a new present. So you're always, you got it. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. No, you got it, man. Exactly. So, um, so that's kind of what I see with Janice. I, I see a, a heavy mercurial correspondence. Mercury is like a three in one sort of thing. So when, with symbolism, when you have two things, man and woman, as an example, these two pillars, whatever, it creates a third thing. There, there's always a third thing that's created. Just yeah. the two in and of itself creates a third, basically. So there's a triune relationship with Janus by virtue of these two faces, masculine, feminine, all these things. This third thing is related to this middle path, middle pillar sort of business. And uh, Mercury heavily relates to the number three as well. And so um, you have figures yeah. like, in my opinion, mythological figures like uh, Hermes Trismegistus, the thrice great Hermes Trismegistus, right? 33 is said to be like a hermetic mercurial sort of number as well. 33 vertebrae yeah. along our spine, which is our symbolic pole, right? Yeah. Um, and so by being dualistic in nature, there's actually a third thing that's always implied. And to me, this is the true unifying sort of force or unifying aspect of the, of the three things, right? And so to me, that third thing that's more holistic and, and synthesizes the two things is actually polar. And one way I've put this and one thing I've understood over time, and it took me admittedly a long time to finally really get it. And I think I got it now, but polarity precedes duality. The pole in and of itself, you have two ends, almost like a positive and a negative, but they're connected. Mm -hmm. This is a polar symbol, a, just a, a straight pole. That's a polar symbol. There's polarity here. But duality is like the separation of those two things. Duality would be like the acknowledgement of like the black and the white, the masculine, oh. the feminine. But the two came from the one. So the number one, in my opinion, it's a symbolic pole, right? It's polarity. There's only one one, in my opinion. 
in the world of symbolism, there's only one one. That's what it represents. The two can be viewed a few different ways. I used to say that the two is symbolically two aspects of the one or the one being divided in half, right? So now you have two parts, right? Or that the three would be the, um, the one broken up into thirds, right? Or the four would be uh, the four aspects of the one, essentially, right? Or another way of looking at it would be the one perceives itself, right? That there's a reflection, that it actually can, um, uh, yeah, acknowledge itself almost like a, a mirror or something. And that that is where the two came from. That the two is just one reflecting upon itself. And then all of the other numbers basically kind of come from there. There's only truly one one in the yeah. world of symbolism. There is no second one. It's almost like uh, there's only one true God or supreme deity, right? Essentially, it's kind of one way of looking at the one. And is it an interesting that the one itself, how we tend to write it, is just one straight vertical line because it's yeah. actually the world axis. It's it's the axle that everything revolves around. Yeah. Yeah, Mercury is also very, uh, very much associated with uh, Wotan, Odin, the Grey Wanderer, oh, yeah. the, uh, the one who, exactly. the the only god, I believe, with the help of Sleipnir, a legged, a legged horse, is able to go over and through the the realms more more easily. He is, you know, he is a psychopomp. He is the, uh, he is a, uh, a god of of death he is a he is the magician he has the uh the rings he has uh like the one ring and each ninth night eight more rings uh come wow. from it so you have you know nine rings again which uh, it's funny like i i just um mentioned that on a uh a live stream from Zaralath yesterday he did a lot of uh he went into the uh the box saga again and i'm actually hearing a lot of box saga in in this as well you know poles and holes Absolutely. i i knew there was there was something something with it so you have uh you know with odin and the ninth knight eight rings but you have one ring to rule them all uh tolkien very much understood that what is his second book second book the two towers third yes. book return, point, return yeah. of the king yeah it's you know the hero's journey incredibly classic story the, the fellowship nine members if i'm not mistaken at first yeah no this is absolutely this is amazing and there's so much to to see in this i mean even as you said like the with just the the one the pole being multiple or becoming multiple like what i envisioned right away is if you cut a pole in half you have two you lay them over each other you have the x you know, you add another, you have the triangle. If you add, that's which is the three, add another, you have the four, you have the cube. That's it. Yeah, exactly right. Wow. Yeah, even, uh, you know, just kind of, just to tie some of these threads together a little bit, you know, so Odin has his storyline with uh, the world tree and then with um, having one eye, right? It's been yeah. said, even the letter I in the box saga, according to box saga people, the letter I is the world axis and the dot on top of the I is supposed to be the pole star, which I think yeah. is really, really fascinating. Right. And what I've picked up over time from my estimation is that all King symbolism is blueprinted off of an original polar Northern King essentially is what it kind of comes yeah. down to. And it's also this King has a relationship with realms beyond this realm pretty much is like the kind of implication right so a mystical kingdoms mystical lands mystical cities and things like yeah. that when people refer to this by the way in my estimation a mystical kingdom or land or uh, even like a mystery school that's like more etheric and stuff there's several sort of like variations on that theme out there they're talking about a central location in in the ether like in the heavens you know um uh, that can be traveled to through this gate, which is an inner journey, right? This relates to ascension techniques, going within to go to other places. Yeah. There's a whole mysticism, as an example, called Merkaba mysticism. This is a Jewish thing. And that you ride your chariot, your light body, to a palace in the heavens or a, a school in the heavens, basically. You are stationary, but by doing this meditation technique, you go within, access this central gateway, and then go to another place, and then you can actually have 
like a real experience, an astral experience, not a physical experience, but an astral yeah. meditative experience in the heavens. And so this is like a technique that a lot of people have passed down for a very, very, very long time. When you get into it, it's really interesting how many of these schools of thought actually incorporate a northern sky correspondence with everything. That yeah. you're actually, once again, accessing the central gateway, accessing the central stairway and everything else. So uh, Isa in the, in the rune system, the runic system, it mm -hmm. looks like what? It's just a straight vertical line up and down, right? It's the simplest glyph you can have in the system right? It's the simplest one. It's just one straight line. So it's the basis or, or it's the fundamental sort of nature of the whole entire runic system is just one vertical line basically. Right. And it means ice. Um, and so to me, that's just another symbol of, of this primordial sort of expression or whatever, this central sort of axis, this central sort of pole. I even think of like icicles and kind of what they look like, you know, it's just a central pole made of ice, you know, but this central vertical line, too, it relates to the number one, as I've already said, the first card in the Major Arcana that associates with the one is the Magician card. And you brought up magic, right? And Odin. The Magician yeah. card relates to Mercury. That's its ruling planet is Mercury, right? And so magicians and sages and mystics and things like that have had a reverence for Mercury for a very, very long time. And it makes sense, in my opinion, you know? Sometimes you need to be more assertive and you need to project and you need to put yourself out there. Sometimes you need to listen and be more receptive and pay attention, right? So if you're going to sort of manifest things here or make things happen, if your will is actually going to come to fruition, you might have to do either or. You might have to really exercise your masculine. You might have to exercise your feminine, regardless of what gender you actually are, right? You might have to bring those qualities to the table and if you're going to become a magician, you might have to learn how to not get triggered. You might have to learn about the nature of darkness as well as the light, right? And so you have to go different places. That's what being mercurial is. Being mercurial is being flexible and fluid and entertaining these things without having to buy into it or without getting triggered necessarily, right? And yeah. so magic and things related to esoteric, studies and stuff can get uncomfortable depending on what you're looking at you know but evolving can be uncomfortable growing can be uncomfortable right oh yeah and so to be mercurial yeah allows you to go to these different places and take the gems that you need and then kind of like move on right just like mercury mercury in and of itself just traveling going forward always kind of like going and, and seeking something else out right always kind of on the move symbolically but mercury rules the magician card this is the number one card in the major arcana it's not uncommon for the magician to have a tree behind him this is the same world tree that we're speaking to and what does he do in this card i don't know how much you've studied the tarot but not, the magician, not enough. okay, yeah, the magician. Oftentimes, the classic pose that the magician is in, he has one wand. The wand is a phallus. The wand yeah. is an axle. The wand is a staff. It's a pole, right? He has one wand. The wand symbolically means energy being sent forth. By the way, so that's mm -hmm. why if you watch a movie and they have witches and wizards and their spells and whatever, they're gonna cast the spell where they direct their wand, right? It's like you're aiming your magical intention or energy or something. Sure. And so it's energy being sent forth, just like the phallus. The phallus mm. is energy being sent forth. That's what yep. it's all about, right? And so he's holding that wand up to the heavens in one hand, and then he's pointing down to the ground with his other hand, right? Not yeah. unlike Baphomet. Baphomet <clears throat> oftentimes has one hand up and one hand down, and Baphomet is also kind of janice like in so many different ways angel and demon masculine and feminine light and dark yeah. all of these different types of things right he is holding his wand up to the sky he's pointing down to the ground with his other hand and and the letter he corresponds with in hebrew and hebrew isn't all of that by the way it's just the system that most people will associate with the tarot so i use it and, and whatever and I, I do get value out of it but there's certainly other systems other languages that i need to be way more familiar with but the letter that associates with the magician is beth or bet which means house right and so the house in this instance is to me multiple things but all house symbolism relates to the firmament in my opinion 
and it also relates to the cosmos as well, basically, right? And so what he's saying by making this posture and by being related to Mercury, he's saying, I am the central pillar in the house of God. I am the world axis. I connect and separate the above and below. I am the bridge between heaven and earth, essentially, is what he's saying. Because it's all world axis symbolism. It all has to do with that one. It all has to do with the, the, the axis mundi, right? That's another way of putting yeah. it. And so by being um, triune in nature, like Mercury is, he has a triune relationship with the above and below. He plays an important integral part between heaven and earth. And in that instance, in that card, he is the unmoved mover. He is the immutable center, right? And so he is the pillar that holds up the heavens and separates it from earth so that there can be space for things to actually sort of occur. So that, that's just one of my sort of breakdowns. Um, wow. Germanic mythology, North Germanic mythology <clears throat> connects so much to this, which is, of course, like it is very much polar in, in nature. Uh, Wotan is the wanderer you know he, he right. is the uh the gray wanderer so he's not black and not white he's grays you know in the middle oh there you go exactly and he perfect and oh wow yeah and together with his his two brothers philly and Vey, so a uh, a triad created the first man and the first woman from a uh a ash tree and elm tree and from the very first primordial giant they uh, from his body they created well our physical planet and from his his skull his his dome really the heavens were made which also kind of implies indeed that that is where like the the knowledge is and held up at the four cardinal points by four dwarves Wow, I'm seeing so many connections. Like, this is this is amazing, man. That's awesome. I'm really happy to hear it. Yeah, exactly. So, correct me if I'm mistaken here, because it's not so much my uh, wheelhouse necessarily. But what I've mm -hmm. heard is that a lot of people like to say, and certainly even with Mercury, just to kind of preempt what I'm about to say, Mercury has a triune nature. What I've learned is that there is symbolic things associated with mercury that are extremely solar that you cannot deny that relate to mercury for mercury for a long time was something that i'm like i had a hard time understanding because it related to too many different things and then i realized that that's actually what it's supposed to represent it's supposed to represent all of these different things even mercury itself has been like a metaphor for literally just either or spirit itself right all permeating right the space between spaces and liminal yeah. things but mercury has a solar correspondence there's a lot of solar symbolism i'm going to do a presentation at some point about all of this there's a lot of lunar symbolism associated with mercury as well even a uh, thoth thoth from ancient egypt was like the mercurial correspondence and he was a moon god yeah um, and then there's lots of symbolism related to travel that relate to the moon as well and cycles in time and, and whatnot but then mercury also has a polar nature to him as well so there's a solar lunar and polar nature to mercury that to me is undeniable but what I've heard is that Odin, oftentimes in today's world, people associate him with more like solar symbolism, but he's actually more mercurial in nature. Is that kind of how you see it? Have you thought about that? This is a first hearing, actually, for me, that people associate Odin with solar symbolism because he is not, he is not solar exactly. symbolism. It might be I an American know. thing. Yeah, might just, might just be, but because, you know, like from the, the European pagans that, I know, you know, like Dutch, Germanic, wherever, just the European pagans. Uh, Odin is, yeah, he's he's polar and uh, all encompassing. He is the all father, you know. He is the the father of of the gods. He indeed also has his spear to and to um, to gain and understand the magic of the runes. He hung himself on a windswept tree for nine days and nine nights but yeah odin is polar he's absolutely polar symbolism definitely 
I don't for know sure. how they... Yeah, that's how I see it, too. I, I'm going out off of a friend who was really frustrated, actually. And she was reading a bunch of stuff, and she was saying, like, I cannot believe people associate Odin with the sun. I don't see the sun thing at all. No. It's, it's more... It's more polar in nature or even more uh, Mercury being this triune, this all father sort of concept of having all of these expressions, you know, three, three and mean, one or whatever you might want to say. His his son, perhaps, Balder, uh, the shining one, the most beautiful of all the gods, mm -hmm. he would be uh, more solar symbolism, I guess. I could see that, yeah. No, no, I think you're right. I don't, I don't think it makes sense to try and parse out why, why other people may associate that because I think I don't think it's correct. No, it's definitely, definitely not. Odin is not a, he's not a solar god. Right, right. No, that I mean that makes all the sense to me for sure. Yeah, some people make the weirdest associations. <laughs> I know you're telling me, man. I know. I really, it's been interesting. The more I've gotten to learn about symbolism and sort of my perspective on, on how it works. And I feel like I'm coming across now after this sort of like multi-year long journey, I feel like I'm coming across my, the best authors I've ever come across who have the, the greatest handle on what some of this stuff means. Yeah. And as I do that, hearing other people's decodings to me, you know, it's become a thing where um, I just, it's taken a lot of patience. You know, I have to exercise patience and, and gratitude and, and compassion and things like that. Yeah. Because yeah. I hear things and I'm like, that is not correct in my opinion. But, you know, I was once at a place too where I didn't know so many different things about um, the world and, and, and how these things break down. I never knew about this primordial or polar tradition or whatever you want to refer to it as. So mm -hmm. I try and be as sort of uh, understanding as possible when I hear people talk about things online. Um, but simply put, a lot of people aren't putting in like serious work into wanting to know, I think. But everyone is titled to their opinion, entitled to their opinion. So it's like symbolism is one of those <laughs> things where it's almost like you can't take away somebody's right to have their own interpretation of things. You know, because everything here literally is symbolic. True. True. And people will interpret it, interpret different things in, in different ways. That's, yeah. Um, even though some are definitely head scratchers. For sure. For sure. But, oh man, this has been, I have a lot to, lot to think about. Like I have seen so many connections just straight away and like it so validates um like the the sagas as well the uh, yeah. the Norse sagas and just the the stories of of odin and who they who they are like who the gods are as you know as people are as gods really there's some yep. discussion that you know the gods are our ancestors they did once walk the earth which may be the case i don't know i'm still but yeah man keys scales poles and holes <laughs> wow that's it yeah no exactly um even the spear you mentioned odin's spear you know and it's mm -hmm. like that's a classic world axis symbol it's essentially a pole you know um yeah. what i found personally is that it's kind of related but a lot of objects represent this so many objects represent this that's why it's like a never-ending sort of thing um, it's about knowing how it sort of has represented it. And what I found is that a lot of objects that people like to talk about in these sort of circles, the Holy Grail, right, as an example, mm -hmm. uh, another spear symbol, the Spear of Destiny, as an example, the Philosopher's yeah. Stone is probably one of the greatest examples, actually. They all represent this same dynamic, the, the world axis. It, it, they all represent something that is central, um, something that goes back to the origin of all things. And so people look for the Holy Grail. People look for these different sort of artifacts. The, the Philosopher's Stone, people want to make the Philosopher's Stone. The Philosopher's Stone is in the center of all things. In fact, that's what stone symbolism uh, often represents. What I found when you look into the stone itself is that it represents the point of pivot. Once again, uh, like the Kaaba cube, it's a symbolic mm -hmm. stone. It might as well be a symbolic stone. There's actually a stone embedded in the corner, which has all sorts of mystical, um, you know, history associated with it. Basically, I already mentioned the standing stone and things like this. The stone mm -hmm. or the rock represents a marker, 
right? The X represents a mark, basically. That's another thing that the X represents. The stone represents a marker of some kind. And as it relates to the central location of things, sometimes that stone was referred to as the stone of proportions, the stone of division, because it divided the land, right? It's, it's almost like a pie chart, or it's almost like a wheel, that the central point in the middle of the wheel is the point from which all of the spokes emanate, or the middle of a pie chart from which all of the lines emanate that breaks up the wedges, right? That's yeah. what the stone symbolically represented. So it was a stone of portions or proportions or a stone of division, right? And so it marked the center, you know? And so even today you have things like milestone, that's a marker, right? It, you, yeah. They used to put stones at the mile marker. So the stone has been used as a, as a point that marks something. Mm -hmm. And so there's lots of, when you start looking into it, there's lots of words that kind of correspond with it in an interesting way. Yeah. But the stone and represents that marker, that center, but then it also represents the totality of everything. So the stone mm -hmm. also represents the cosmos itself. It also represents the universe, basically. So it's the point in the middle that from which everything revolves, but it's also everything itself, right? A lot of symbols actually kind of break down that way. So the philosopher's stone is within, symbolically, in my opinion, right? It's So it's within all of us. It can be sought by all of us. And there's yeah. even... There's alchemical traditions where they say in, in order to find the Philosopher's Stone, you have to go to the center of Earth, right? The quest for the center of Earth is the symbolic quest to the center of self, essentially. And to me, I see that these things are completely related, but I see that you were going to say something. What were you going to say? No, yeah, no, I'm just thinking like you, uh, you spoke about the uh, earlier, like the um, leaders, like the heads of society being like in the in the middle being the in between they are also supposed to be the cornerstones of society you know they they hold everything together and even like very basically like very primal like what are all men obsessed with sticks like just as a kid <laughs> like how great yeah. was it if you just found a like just a good stick, you know, like making all the other yeah, kids in yeah. the neighborhood jealous because you've just found a good stick. And like, what is another other thing that we are obsessed with, which we made into a whole sport now called strongman lifting heavy stones because, mm. you know, that's a, a show of, uh, like it's a sign of manliness. Like, look at me, I can lift this, this heavy, heavy rock off the ground. Therefore I'm more manlier than, than you are, which is, you know, cocky, cock, you know, who has the biggest yeah, exactly. one. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You, you totally got it, man. I like it. Uh, the stick thing for sure. It, 100%. The, uh, sometimes they're referred to as the wild man or the green man, right? Mm -hmm. Oftentimes older versions of this wild man or the green man, they're holding a giant tree on their shoulder or they're holding a giant uh, branch on their shoulder, basically. Sometimes you even see Santa as being kind of almost emulating this exact same thing. And he's holding a, cr a small Christmas tree on his shoulder, basically, right? In oh. older depictions of Santa Claus. And so uh, there's a whole history of these figures that hold branches and poles and sticks and things like that and, and whole trees as well. Um, and it just relates back to this old archetype of the traveler and this traveling dynamic, what the big sort of correspondence is, in my opinion, is traveling between worlds. That is the dynamic. Sometimes it's even between the old world and the new world. So St. John the Baptist, that was his thing, right? And so he brought old knowledge to the table. And so a lot of times their wisdom is from a primordial age. It's from a polar age. It's from an earlier tradition. And yeah. it's foreign to people who are in the modern world. The modern people are like, wait, what? You're you're doing this and that. I don't understand it. What does this all mean? You know, why do you why is this a tradition or how does this make sense magically or whatever it is, whatever um, that might be. But the idea is that these old wisdom keepers coming to the modern world and bestowing this knowledge upon people that has kind of seemingly been lost. But I see it is that this primordial tradition or polar tradition, the mystic pole tradition, it's not lost. It's actually hidden. It's actually everywhere. But yeah. if you have the eyes to see it, you can see it. If you've never heard of it or don't understand it and it's not your thing, you're never going to see it or come across it, right? 
But uh, to your point with stones, the other one I want to bring up is the keystone. And so the keystone is the central stone in an arch, right? And so there's a whole entire branch of Freemasonry called Royal Arch Freemason Freemasonry. And their yeah. whole motif, the main thing is two pillars, the same two pillars we've been talking about this whole time, an arch that goes between them. And in the middle of that arch, you have the keystone, right? It's yeah. right where the central pillar would be. Based times in Masonic tracing boards, that keystone is missing or it's removed and light is actually shining through it uh, pretty much. And so I've done whole entire breakdowns and what that means symbolically, but it does relate to the solstices actually being a symbolic pole because oftentimes that keystone will have the glyph of cancer right there in the middle. Yeah. And so it's pretty interesting that that would even be the case. Um, cancer, the glyph of cancer looks like it's just spinning, right? It looks like a six, uh, it looks like the six nine is spinning or it looks like the uh, yin yang glyph. Kind yeah, of just, exactly. Uh, spinning around, right? This is the spinning of the cosmos. This is the spinning of the fixed stars around that central star. It's comparing it to the true middle column or middle pillar, which is basically, again, the world axis. Um, so anyway, so the keystone has a world axis correspondence to it, like for sure, for sure. Even in Freemasonry, they, they have so many different illustrations where they're showing literally a stairway to the central, where the central column yeah. is. And sometimes the stairway leads to, or a uh, a, a ladder, uh, Jacob's ladder, it's penetrating the heavens and right around where it's actually going through the clouds, there's seven stars. This would be the seven stars of Ursa Major. For people who've never heard me talk about this, just briefly, my opinion is that in this primordial polar age, the original seven stars of enlightenment were the seven stars of Ursa Major, which are really close to the pole star. And since then, these seven stars, the symbolism associated with them have shifted to other places. And so like the Pleiades is one example, right? Uh, within Taurus, some people say that that is the stairway to heaven. In my opinion, based on my research, there was a symbolic transference. That's what some people have referred to it as, is that these original seven stars were in the north and then everything kind of dispersed in the solar age. And so I am kind of of the opinion now that the Signs of the Zodiac, which are along the line of uh, the ecliptic, the path of the sun, the symbolism for the Zodiac signs come from the northern sky. Ancient peoples, that was their original sky clock, was the northern sky. Ursa Major yeah. going around the pole star. Now modern peoples, their sky clock has more to do with the sun and the path of the sun and the signs you know, around the sun. So there, there's multiple examples of this being the case. I've read that the ancient Chinese people... They had eight constellations in the northern sky when they were polar, and they shifted them to the path of the sun when they became solar, and then they added four more constellations, giving them 12 constellations. So uh, oh. the origin of all things, terrestrial and celestial, come from the north, in my opinion. That That's... That's my thing. So if people like this perspective, they can find more of it on my channel <laughs> and things like that. It's not for everybody, but it, to me, it's, it's where all of the sort of like real gems are in my opinion now that i've read what i've read and now that i've you know have multiple years studying symbolism under my belt the world axis is the gift that keeps on giving if you've never heard of it and you're really interested in symbolism it's it's, it's a true game changer yeah no it, it absolutely is i mean we're just under hour and a half in and i i knew some stuff of course you know it's not my like not the first time talking about uh, symbols or like northern uh, traditional, uh, you know, topics. Man, like you, you, you have cleared up just so many things and connected so many, so many dots for me. Like when you were talking about like the um, the old world and the new worlds, like I was even thinking of uh, like the physicality of it because I was my hometown is actually the town from where. <clears throat> the um, people left to go to the new world. Uh, that's actually oh. where the, um, the the name of the ship I can can't remember. But you know the the last hometown of the pilgrims before they went to the new world was actually my hometown. So I, I kind of have mm. a connection with that, and of course, being married to an American also helps. But like the a big 
boats, like sailboats, what do you need? You need to cross because you need you need to put your sail on somewhere. Like what's the very base of the cross? Well, it's just, it's a pole. And on that pole, <laughs> yeah, you right, attach yeah. another pole. And on those poles, you attach a sail so that you can move forward, so that you can travel really, so that you can see different things, learn different things, learn from different people so that you can be that, that wanderer across the seven seas. That's right. Yeah. Wow. Exactly right. And you know, if you knew where the pole star was at, that would be very helpful for you, you know, to True. know where yeah. you're going. And even if you can't see the pole star and you're paying attention to other constellations, it's by their proximity to that central star is how you know where you're getting. You have to pay attention to the time of year and where these constellations are, you know, and where they're at in, in you know, at the point in time in which you're looking at them and everything else. So that gives you your orientation. Yeah, man, there's a ton of world axis, northern polar symbolism, especially northern sky symbolism associated with oceanic um, voyages and aquatic symbolism and things like that. Because it's so, it's just baked into, you know, who we are as people and things like that. Damn, I'm, I'm going to have to take a breather after this one, man. This has been... <laughs> gotcha. No, was... Awesome, man. Well, I'm glad to hear I can clear things up for you. To me, part of my thing is like bringing things back to like this extremely simple thing. So some of the things that I told you about aren't that complicated, really. You know, no. if, if anything, we've overcomplicated stuff, you know, and so people think symbolism is this overly complicated sort of thing and only like certain people are privy to understand it or whatever. And to me, when you really break things down, it's actually much, much simpler, much, much simpler, excuse me, than you even realize. So that's what I try and do for people. But I'm glad you got something out of this conversation. And, you know, I definitely had a good time. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's like bringing it back to simplicity. I mean, that's, that's what like actual smart people are able to do you know everyone can use mm -hmm. use big words and fancy terms and whatever but true intelligence true genius is being able to explain it so that everyone of every you know level of society or level of knowledge is able to to understand it at least for me and i assume i'm just going to assume my audience as well later on when this you know, when this releases you have made a lot of things very clear and have made me see a lot of connections and this is these are definitely things i'm gonna take with me into the into the future as i just you know walk further on the on the path and start growing my my understanding yeah this is this is great. Symbolism cool. is well, not art. You just need you just need someone yeah. like Mario to explain it to you that we understand. There you go. And you know, honestly, dude, um, I'm able to speak about a lot of this stuff now because I've given or I've been given so many opportunities to talk about it with people. And so, thank you for the opportunity because every time I'm able to explain myself, it just gives me that one more chance to kind of put things together in maybe a way I didn't you know, uh, see beforehand and, and then you're adding things to the table that's making me think and all of that. So it's all just part of the process. Um, so thanks again. And, and yeah, if you ever uh, want to do it again, just let me know and we'll make it happen. For sure, man. For sure. Before I end this, just let the people know where they, where they can find you, where they can find more of these amazing symbolic studies. Sure. Right on. Yeah. People can go to my site, symbolic studies.com. And I would say, YouTube and Instagram have become sort of hubs for the channel, you know, so if you want to see more long form content, definitely check out my YouTube and check out my live tab too, because I have multiple, multiple hours of content on there and I do a lot of short videos, but I also do presentations. And then if people want the sort of polar decode of the tarot, they can join my Patreon, um, Symbolic Studies is on Patreon, so patreon.com slash symbolic studies, or they can go to my site and I also have a thing, a paywall uh, for the same content on my site. It's just five bucks a month, but I'm going through every single major Arcana card. I just completed the eighth video. Um, and, and so there's like eight hours of just breaking down the tarot through the polar lens generally. And I'm really oh, wow. giving it my all. I'm, I'm trying to put out as much information as possible as I can about it. And at some point, I'll finish the whole entire Major Arcana. 
Um, but to my knowledge, the polar perspective from the tarot has not really been a thing that anyone has done yet. Um, but I make a lot of great points, I think. And if you like what I'm bringing to the table here, then you should definitely check that out. But yeah, man, this was a pleasure. Thanks again. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Of course, make sure that all the important links are in the description down below for uh, both the video and audio version, because uh, people need to study this. There's more symbolism and symbology. It's, it's all so important and really not that hard. You know, you, you explain it very clearly. Yeah, we do overcomplicate things. That's, that is very true indeed so yeah i mean thanks everyone for watching thanks everyone for listening uh, if you like what we do with the greyhound pagans podcast and the tribe of the greyhound pagans go to our website www.greyhoundpagans.com where you can find everything from the podcast of course to our blogs merchandise special episodes for our Spreaker supporters, of course. Yeah, don't forget to leave a like, leave something nice in the comments, your favorite symbol, perhaps, and why it is your okay. favorite symbol. Everyone has one. Come on, share this with everyone. Just everyone, you know, your parents, your sister, share it with your cats for all I care. Um, and we will all see you and next time. This has been absolutely amazing, Mario. Thank you again. Uh, I will have to let this simmer for a bit and think things over again. See if I can uh, connect even more dots. But before I do that, just let it simmer, let it sink in a bit. So again, thank you all for watching. Thank you. And yeah, until next time, everyone. Bye-bye. This was yet another amazing episode of the Greyhorn Pagans podcast. We thank you all for watching. We thank you all for listening. Remember to like, share, subscribe and hit that notification bell so you will be notified whenever we upload something new. Support us on Patreon for early access and for everything else that we do with the tribe, for everything else that we do with the podcast. Find us on www.greyhornpagans.com For now, we thank you and until next time.